the football highlights of the world champion Kansas City Chiefs. This is the brightest day I've had in my sports career, I'll tell you for sure, and I don't think there'll ever be one to equal. I want to introduce, I want to introduce the greatest quarterback in pro football, Lenny Dawson. And now, the greatest coach in pro football, Hank Stramp. Thank you very much. We're very proud of the recognition that we established as champions of the world of professional football. And we sincerely think that you people here are the super fans of pro football. Thank you very much. The greatest day in the history of Kansas City. This team is the greatest in the universe. Hank Stram became the winningest coach of the winningest team in AFL history because of an irrepressible drive to find a way to win. He built a team of infinite variety, from its opportunistic special teams to the longest and most accurate place kicker in football. He built a defense which led the league in virtually every category. Number 75, Jerry Mays, was voted the AFL's all-time best defensive end. Number 87, Aaron Brown, became one of the strongest defensive ends in the game. All-pro Buck Buchanan, number 86, has long been a pillar of strength in the middle. He was joined at tackle by number 61, Curly Culp, the former NCAA wrestling champion who now throws football players for a living. Middle linebacker Willie Lanier, number 63, is one of the best at getting to the ball, playing off the block, and then punishing the ball carrier. Number 51, Jim Lynch, is one of the most mobile linebackers in football. Bobby Bell was voted the AFL's all-time best outside linebacker. He is a collision looking for a place to happen. The Chiefs secondary has always had tough hitters. Rookie cornerback Jim Marcellus stepped right in. The Chiefs grabbed 32 interceptions, the most in pro football. Johnny Robinson, number 42, the AFL's all-time best safety man had eight interceptions, second best in the league. Number 18, Emmett Thomas led the league with nine. Jim Kearney, number 46, became one of football's strongest strong safeties. Smart, aggressive, fast, he always seemed to be making good things happen for the Chiefs. He is the valuable but unsung kind of player every championship team must have. Hank Stram's revolutionary offense has caused pro defenses many anxious moments. Sometimes it really helps to have a quarterback who can run. Usually, however, the big five, Tyre, Hill, Buddy, Mormon, and Holub, facilitated the more noticeable parts of the game, like the forward pass. 
One of the more noticeable Chiefs was number 84, Fred Arbanis, the AFL's all-time best tight end. More often, the ball was thrown to a sticky-fingered wide receiver like Gloucester Richardson, number 30. Or number 25, Frank Pitts, one of the swiftest runners in pro football. And of course, Otis Taylor, the game breaker. the Chiefs led the league in rushing. Number 38, Wendell Hayes, was the battering ram. And then there were the many backs. Number 6, Warren Motormouse McVeigh. Number 45, Robert the Tank Holmes. And number 21, Marvelous Mike Garrett. They are only 5 feet 9 inches tall, but they are among the game's most scintillating performers. had the Chiefs supremely fit for the season's opener in sunny San Diego. As usual, the Chiefs' defense swarmed all over the Chargers. And as usual, their favorite target was quarterback John Hadle. Hadle was forced into four interceptions, two by Johnny Robinson. Despite a painfully swollen passing hand, Len Dawson threw two touchdown passes to Otis Taylor as the Chiefs swept past the Chargers 27 to 9. Kansas City Chiefs coach Hank Stram believes in a certain style of football. And in Boston last Sunday, the Patriots found out that the Chiefs have learned it well. When the Kansas City offense took the field, their style exuded a smoothness born of confidence. A ruggedness born of power. Led by number 16 quarterback Lynn Dawson, they scored in patterns that flowed with liquid grace. Led by Robert the Tank Holmes, 
they scored with bruising stubbornness. Perhaps the Chiefs' offensive style was best exemplified by the flashing legs of number one, Nolan Smith, who returns a punt with all the dazzle available and 154 pounds of quicksilver. Perhaps their style rested in the deft hands of number 89, Otis Taylor, whose confidence and poise helped put Kansas City ahead 14-0. While the offensive game was fluid, the Chiefs' defensive style was frenetic and effective. Led by number 75, Jerry Mays, and number 63, Willie Lanier, they pounded the Patriots into submission, allowing them only 100 yards in total offense for the entire game. Mike Garrett ran wild as he scored two touchdowns and provided a control consistency to the Chiefs' ground game. Once he had decided where he wanted to be, determination got him there. The 31-0 thrashing convinced the Patriots that in Kansas City they do things with style. And it's a style that spells trouble for the rest of the American... When the Kansas City Chiefs met Cincinnati, they seemed to be suffering from an identity problem. Sometimes they looked like the powerful super chiefs they were supposed to be. But more often, they didn't. Luckily for them, Jan Stenerud, number three, was his consistent self as he gave Kansas City a 6-0 lead. However, Bingo fans should not have been disheartened. They should have known by now that the Paul Brown Quick Messenger Service is becoming ever more consistent in its delivery. Quarterback Greg Cook, number 12, did the throwing, and the Chiefs got the bad news as Eric Crabtree, number 10, went 73 yards to give Cincinnati a 7-6 lead. But then quarterback Cook was welcomed to hard times by Kansas City's number 51, Jim Lynch. A muscle pull in his throwing arm put Cook out of the game. Of course, the Chiefs felt little sympathy as they were playing without their starting signal caller, Lynn Dawson.
Quarterback Jackie Lee, number 15, put the game in its proper perspective by hitting Gloucester Richardson, number 30, for a touchdown and a 13-10 lead at the half. But quarterback Sam White, number 14, came off the bench and hooked up on an 80-yard touchdown pass to Bengal Bob Truppy, number 84, who was rather emphatic about the score. Weiss received plaudits from Coach Brown. And the inexperienced Bengals continued to play heads up ball as number 18, Paul Robinson, added 22 yards to the home team's offense. A 10 yard tearaway touchdown by number 30, Jess Phillips, increased the Cincinnati lead to 24 to 13. However, with only 123 left in the game, the Chiefs' Wendell Hayes, number 38, skirted the left side to close the gap to 24-19. There seemed to be some Chief chicanery afoot as time ticked away. But the joke was on Kansas City as the Bengals' 24 points were enough to keep their three-week shockwave rolling. Quarterback Jackie Lee led the Chiefs to an early lead the next week in Cincinnati. But then Lee broke an ankle. And it was the Bengals who made the big plays. Bengals won 24 to 19, and the Chiefs left Cincinnati in third place and without their top two quarterbacks. And then there was the forgotten team of the West, Kansas City, forgotten because of an injury to this man, all-time league-leading passer Lynn Dawson. When the Chiefs also lost their second quarterback, Jackie Lee, all Super Bowl chances were supposedly gone. Against the Chiefs in Denver's Mile High Mud Bowl last week, healthy quarterback Pete Lesk threw, and number 88, Al Denson, had caught a touchdown pass in all four games this year. But for most of the afternoon, the Chiefs' powerful defense kept the Bronco offense groveling in the mud. One of Pete Lisk's passes straight into the hands of number 46, Chief Tight Safety Jim Kearney, who skimmed over 60 yards of muck to a Kansas City touchdown. Meanwhile, surprise, the Chiefs have a quarterback too. Number 10 is a six foot three, 212 pounder who broke most of Don Meredith's passing records at SMU. In this his first pro start, he hit on 14 passes for more than 200 yards. His name is Mike Livingston. His passes to number 84, Fred Arbanis, and number 89, Otis Taylor, set up the Chiefs' first score. A great aid to any passing quarterback is the draw play, as executed by number 45, Robert Holmes. In the first half, Jan Stenerud kicked three of his four field goals, including this one from 54 yards. In the second half, as the cool shadows lengthened, Mike Livingston and the Chiefs iced the game. Livingston passed to Wendell Hayes for 17 yards. 
He then passed for 18 yards to Otis Taylor, who battled onward as only Otis Taylor can. For the crushing touchdown, Livingston handed off to another new chief star from Texas, running back Warren McVay, recently obtained from Cincinnati. As we review that last play, the effectiveness of the Chiefs' upfront blocking becomes apparent as number six McVay skitters by with a new way to a Kansas City victory. Mike Livingston and Warren McVay will be heard from again. And so will the rest of the somewhat prematurely forgotten team of the West, the Kansas City Chiefs. The next week, the Chiefs hobbled into Denver. The starting quarterback position had passed to a young man named Mike Livingston, who had never before started a pro game. For three periods, two rugged teams slugged it out in a swamp. Finally, a perfect sweep sprung newly acquired Warren McVeigh, and Hank Stram had found a new way to win. Then came the home opener against the Indoor Oilers. The opening handshake was the last sane event of the day. From now on, the record book will read, most fumbles, game. Kansas City, 10. veteran punter Gerald Wilson averaged almost 50 yards. Houston's rookie Roy Girella didn't fare so well. Any kind of a kick was risky at best. Of course, a touchdown is better than a field goal any day. In Kansas City, there's a magnificently painted and manicured playing field. Last Sunday, the indoor Oilers brought a three-game win streak from their own safe dry carpet in Houston. The captain shook hands, and Sunday's last bit of sanity was over. Through the monsoon, number 10 Chief Quarterback Mike Livingston not only completed more than half his passes, he also proved he can run a little too. Not scramble, run. Number 45, Robert Holmes, reaffirmed that he can cut through swamp land with the best of them. Mike Garrett plunged for the Chiefs' first score, and that was really enough to win. But there were other more exotic Chiefs' scores, such as the last play of the first half. Tom Flores, number 12, set up a field goal at the Houston 40. A touchdown is better than a field goal any day. Most of the Chiefs' scoring was rather simple due to the Oilers' unique punting game. Repeating the play, we can see that being a kicker 
has its awkward moment. All day, most plays began as planned, but wound up being rather different from the way the coaches diagrammed them. From now on, the AFL record book will read, most fumbles both teams gain. 14, Kansas City 10, Houston 4. Oh yes, Kansas City won 24 to nothing. The following week against Miami, Mike Livingston led the Chiefs to their third straight victory with his first 300-yard passing day, including the longest play from scrimmage of the pro season, 93 yards to Otis Taylor, who pulled a muscle but was rescued by Robert Holmes. One of the hardest fought contests in the AFL last Sunday was waged in Kansas City. Nearly every inch of ground was earned by spectacular second effort. Number 89, Otis Taylor, twisted and hopped for 19 yards. Number 21, Mike Garrett, persisted for a spinning nine yard touchdown. Miami desperately wanted its first win. Quarterback Bob Greasy hit number 39 Larry Zonka who refused to stop until he got 20 yards. Miami rookie number 22 Eugene Mercury Morris turned two punt returns into gold with second, third and fourth efforts. Then he desired his way to outside daylight and burned nine yards for a Dolphin touchdown. But the play that made the difference was second effort at its most spectacular. Rookie Mike Livingston threw to Otis Taylor, who beat number 49 Jim Warren for a great catch. But Warren never let up and caught up to Taylor. But number 45, Robert Holmes, followed Taylor to block and wound up icing the cake. 93 yards and a touchdown. Winless Miami lost another heartbreaker to powerful Kansas City, and they lost again by only one touchdown, 17 to 10. And the largest crowd in Kansas City history came to see if Livingston could continue his startling success against Cincinnati. Livingston overcame his errors of inexperience and threw three touchdown passes. One to Gloucester Richardson, one to Mike Garrett, and one to Robert Holmes, who does everything within his power to make every play a touchdown. The crusher was applied by former Bengal Warren McVeigh, who skittered 80 torturous yards to a touchdown as the injury-riddled Chiefs closed the first half of the season by avenging their only defeat. In Kansas City, as in Green Bay, Ground power is a successful way of life. 
Against the Cincinnati Bengals, the Chiefs swept, slanted, and slashed for more than 300 yards on the ground. No one on Cincinnati's bench could stop them. All four of the Chiefs setbacks who played scored. Wendell Hayes punched over from the four. Kansas City's second score came on a pass to Robert the Tank Holmes, who showed the effectiveness of a tank airlifted behind enemy lines. But Cincinnati was far from a pushover. The Bengals have a 6'6 tight end named Bob Truffy, whose own running style put Cincinnati back in the game. Shortly before the half, the Chiefs took a 21 to 12 lead on a post pattern from Mike Livingston to Gloucester Richardson. The game looked like a runaway when Kansas City opened the third quarter with a 72-yard drive that ended in Mike Garrett's touchdown catch. But Paul Brown's expansion team never let up. Harry Gunner picked off a Livingston pass, and 70 yards later, it was a close ball game again. close until the fourth quarter. Then the Chiefs ground power paid off. Warren McVeigh on a brilliant 80 yard run. But the ex-University of Houston star was not the only one to shine. Downfield blocking turns long gains into touchdowns and with practically an armada of blockers, McVeigh scored the clinching touchdown. What remained only made Cincinnati's effort seem less than it really was. The following kickoff return was fumbled and gave Kansas City's goalie sellers a chance to balloon the score and take the game completely out of reach. In a mere eight seconds, the Chiefs turned a close contest into a rout. The second half of the season began in Buffalo, where the famous O.J. Simpson got his first look at the famous Kansas City defense. Even more of a target was quarterback Dan Dara. The front four dumped him nine times for more than 90 yards and losses, as the Chiefs racked up their fifth straight victory, 29-7. Back home, another record crowd saw Warren McVay's left hand knock out the Chargers as the Chiefs rolled to their sixth straight win. In Kansas City, the Chiefs and the Chargers beat each other up in a tough defensive battle as each team held the other to less than 100 yards rushing. San Diego intercepted Chief Quarterback Lynn Dawson three times. Number 45, Speedy Duncan, got the first one and set up a Charger field goal. But that was the only score for San Diego. Backup quarterback number 14, Marty Domras, played the whole game in place of bench John Hadle. He was dumped six times by the tough Kansas City rush. He was also intercepted five times, once by number 46, Jim Kearney, as the Chiefs proved to be the more irresistible force. Then the Chiefs called upon their inexhaustible supply of offensive talent. Number 21, Mike Garrett, pulled off another of his twist-and-go touchdowns. 
Then Lynn Dawson gave the passing chores to little Warren McVeigh, number six. And he hit number 25, Frank Pitts, who was all alone. Pitts made a 50-yard score out of it. Warren McVeigh also turned a cheap interception into a touchdown of his own from six yards out. The powerful Kansas City Chiefs have a bank full of talent and tricks. San Diego was their sixth straight victim, 27 to three. Joe Namath and the World Champion Jets had also won six straight. And the largest crowd in AFL history jammed New York's Shea Stadium to see Super Joe shoot holes through the Chiefs' bulletproof defense. Sometimes he succeeded. More often, he did not. The other quarterback that day was a man named Dawson, who was ready to test himself against the Jets' tough pass rush. Dawson avoided the pressure long enough to throw three touchdown passes to Otis Taylor. The Chiefs had won their seventh straight 34 to 16, and a national audience finally recognized that the Kansas City Chiefs were for real. Another we have great respect for the Jets. We think they're an excellent football team. Uh, we felt that we could uh, do certain things going into the ball game, and it was very obvious that we felt that we could throw the ball and went, went into the game with a throwing approach. Quarterback Lynn Dawson carried out Coach Stram's plan to the letter. On the game's second play, he threw to number 89, wide receiver Otis Taylor, who pranced all alone through the New York end zone. After just 44 seconds, the Chiefs were ahead. Dawson and Taylor, both back from the disabled list, showed the high-stepping style that has frightened defensive secondaries for the last five years. Three times, the combination clicked for touchdowns. A fourth touchdown on a tight end screenplay was nullified by a penalty. The largest crowd in AFL history sat stunned in Shea Stadium as Dawson and Taylor repeatedly ripped apart the world champion's pass defense. Hank Stram's Red Hot Chiefs were not the only offensive team on the field. There was a quarterback in green who also fired a few well-placed bullets. And against the Chiefs' league-leading defense, each bullet had to be carefully placed. But for most of the afternoon, the Kansas City defense was too much, even for Joe Namath. Repeatedly, the Chiefs hurried his passes. Three times, the Chiefs intercepted inside the 10-yard line. Number 18, Emmett Thomas, snagged one in the end zone. All-pro free safety Johnny Robinson, number 42, added to his league-leading total with his eighth interception of the season. For Kansas City, it was an altogether devastating show. The Chiefs not only rule the airways, but control the ground as well. Number six, miniback Warren McVeigh accounted for more than 100 yards. Powerful Kansas City stopped the Jets' win streak at six, as the Chiefs rolled impressively to their seventh straight victory, 34 to 16.
Another record crowd welcomed their conquering heroes, who in turn welcomed the Oakland Raiders. The Chiefs' offense kept rolling as it had the previous week in New York. Len Dawson continued to throw touchdown passes. One more sailed to Otis Taylor. Still another to Frank Pitts. But the rest of the day was a nightmare revisited. The Raiders literally stole the game 27 to 24. In Kansas City, the Chiefs faced a team which had defeated them in five of the last six games, including last year's Western Division playoff embarrassment. The Raiders prepared to make sure that history would repeat itself. But the Kansas City shock troops of 1969 are deeper than ever. The running backs are small but incredibly resilient, tough and effective. Number 45, Robert Holmes, typifies the extra yardage tenacity which resulted in nearly 200 yards rushing against the Raiders. Warren McVeigh, number six, demonstrated the versatility of the chief running stable as he went wide to give his team an early lead. The Kansas City receiving corps is no less deep or talented. Lynn Dawson threw to people like number 30, Gloucester Richardson, and the Chiefs stung Oakland for 270 yards through the air. The Chiefs also have a receiver who does even more than gets the ball well. Otis Taylor, one of the toughest wide receivers to bring down by one or even two defenders. Taylor's touchdown reception gave Kansas City a quick 14-3 lead. And it looked as though no team in the AFL, including the Raiders, could beat them. No team, that is, except the Chiefs themselves. Kansas City turned the ball over to the alert Raiders seven times in crucial situations on five interceptions and two fumbles. Even when Lynn Dawson completed a pass, there was no guarantee that disaster would not strike. George Atkinson Steele brought Oakland back into the game but the chief defense still gave up ground grudgingly. The Oakland offense sputtered, but thanks to the chief's mistakes, they were constantly afforded fine field position, and Daryl LaMonica's pass to Warren Wells tied the score at 17. The Kansas City offense was not dead yet. Despite their errors, Dawson's perfect pass and Frank Pitt's fine catch again gave the Chiefs the lead and the momentum. Kansas City was driving toward an insurance touchdown when it happened again. Number 55, Dan Connors, was not Dawson's intended receiver. The worried Raider middle linebacker kept checking on his pursuers, but he held on for 75 yards. The touchdown and a George Blanda field goal gave the Raiders a precarious three-point advantage with time running out. Appropriately enough, the last ditch chief comeback attempt was spoiled by a turnover. Number 45, Dave Grayson, had a new AFL career interception record of 46, and the Raiders had vaulted over Kansas City into first place in the West with a 27-24 victory. On Thanksgiving Day against Denver, Len Dawson's knee was re-injured slightly, and the offense was having its problems.
The defense saved the day. Emmett Thomas intercepted and flashed 47 yards to a touchdown. With time running out, Denver trailed by only a touchdown. Coach Lou Saban called for an onside kick. But all-pro linebacker Bobby Bell was ready. Bell's touchdown wrapped up the Chiefs' 19th win in 20 games against the Broncos. Kansas City hosted the Denver Broncos, but started out by being a bit more gracious than necessary to their Thanksgiving Day guests. The Chiefs and the football simply couldn't get together. The usually sure-handed Kansas City mini-backs battled for control of the elusive pigskin and then had to contend with a group of aggressive Bronco defenders. Meanwhile, the Kansas City defense was having a few problems of its own with the evasive quarry, and definite signs of frustration began to appear. Denver quickly recognized Kansas City's lack of affinity for the ball, and number 20, Charlie Greer, was there to hurry things along. While the Chiefs were busy with problems of their own, Denver was provided the opportunity to build a commanding lead. Bronco rookie Bill Thompson returned the opening kickoff deep into Kansas City territory, and Denver moved within field goal range the first four times they gained possession of the ball. Unfortunately for Denver, Bobby Howfield, number three, misfired four straight times, and even the optimism of his teammates couldn't get Denver on the board. Now Bronco coach Lou Saban found reason to vent a few frustrations of his own. Given a reprieve, the Chiefs managed to tame the ball long enough for a little sustained offense, and Warren McVay scored twice from inside the five. The Kansas City Indian Pony Warpaint finally got some exercise, and the Chiefs jumped to a 17-3 halftime lead. Emmett Thomas seemingly clinched the Chiefs' 19th victory over the Broncos in the last 20 games by returning a Steve Tinsey pass 45 yards for a touchdown. But the Kansas City attack suddenly gave out with Lynn Dawson's knee. Dawson re-injured already tender ligaments, and the Chiefs limped through the second half on 61 yards of total offense. With this kind of incentive, Tensey brought the Broncos stampeding back in the fourth period on passes to number 89, John Embry. Wandy Williams, number 29, sidestepped into the end zone, and surprisingly, the Broncos had crept to within one touchdown at 24-17 with only 48 seconds left in the game. Everyone in Kansas City's Municipal Stadium knew an onside kick was coming, but only Bobby Bell, number 78, knew what to do with it. The 31-17 victory kept Kansas City close at Oakland's heels. But the Chiefs' holiday joy was tempered somewhat by concern over their quarterback's condition. And for Lou Saban, Thanksgiving turned out to be a linebacker kickoff return 
and four missed field goals. O.J. Simpson had a second look at the Kansas City defense in the Chiefs' final home game. This time, Jack Kemp was Buffalo's quarterback with a problem. Late in the game, O.J. finally broke loose and tied the score. But place kicker Jan Stenerud kicked five consecutive field goals which not only won the game, but set an all-time pro record of 16 straight without a miss. The Kansas City Chiefs, sporting a glossy 10-2 record, hosted the Buffalo Bills in a game that seemed a mismatch. The Chiefs own most of the AFL's defensive marks, and all day long, Buffalo quarterback Jack Kemp defiantly looked down the muzzle of one of pro football's fiercest defensive lines. Even when Kemp released the ball in time, he paid dearly. And once he was unceremoniously kissed hello from the blind side by 265-pound Aaron Brown, number 87. At game's end, Jack Kemp's bruised body had aged 20 years. On offense, the Chiefs were almost as devastating. Robert Holmes carried Kansas City to their first score as he battered his way to the one. Then he blasted a path through the Bills' stack defense, and the Chiefs led 7-3. Against Buffalo, number 21, Mike Garrett, pretended he was Superman. He darted and danced faster than a speeding bullet. He was more powerful than a locomotive. But alas, poor Mike wasn't able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Whenever the Chiefs sputtered, they call on place kicker Jan Stenerud whose 13th consecutive field goal established a new pro football record as Kansas City built up a 16-6 pad on the Bills. To a housewife, a clothesline means one thing. To a pro football player like Bobby Crockett, it means running pell-mell into sure suicide. Crockett's catch seemed to spur Buffalo, and they drew close to the Chiefs on a touchdown pass from Kemp to Marlon Briscoe. Trailing 19-13 in the final period, Kemp connected with Crockett, who connected with free safety Johnny Robinson. Crockett suffered his second knockdown of the game, but scored his first knockout. <laughs> Buffalo tied the game at 19 as O.J. Simpson streaked around in and left the whole right side of the Kansas City defense in his wake. Only one point now separated Buffalo from possible victory. When Marlon Briscoe was forced to improvise the extra point, the Bills lost their chance for the lead. With just 1.59 left in the game, the Chiefs were spared a tie as Jan Stenerud's fifth consecutive field goal of the day ensured a 22-19 victory. The regular season ended in Oakland. The Chiefs played a cautious, conservative game, passing only six times, running 48 times. Each team scored only one touchdown. For the Raiders, it was enough to defeat the Chiefs for the seventh time in eight games.
The game in Oakland was the last one of the regular season that meant anything title-wise. And its importance showed in the worried faces of both coaches. Even sticky-fingered Warren Wells seemed to have pre-game jitters. Unfortunately for the Raiders, Warren suffered a shoulder separation. And this was his last game of the year. He wasn't the only Oakland receiver to take punishment at the hands of the rugged Kansas City defense. Oakland runners took their lumps too. But quarterback Darrell Amonica stung the Chiefs defense on a 72 yard pass to Wells. A George Blanda field goal gave the Raiders a 3 0 lead which stood until the last quarter when behind perfect pass protection, LaMonica hit number 23, Charlie Smith, for a touchdown. Forced to play catch-up, the Chiefs were powered by number 45, Robert Holmes, as they drove to the Oakland one. Number 38, Wendell Hayes, took it in for the score. But six wasn't enough. And for the second time this year, the Raiders had beaten the Chiefs. For Oakland coach John Madden, it's been a successful first year. His rock-hard defense and explosive offense have given him a 12-1-1 record, which is the best in the AFL. His team is the Western Division champion. And despite the loss of Warren Wells, They'll be tough on anyone they meet in the playoffs. December 20th in cold, blustery Shea Stadium, the AFL playoffs were underway. In the fourth quarter, a New York field goal tied the score after the Jets had been stopped three times from the Kansas City one. On first down, Matt Snell had gained only one half yard. On second down, Bill Mathis had been stopped cold for no gain. On third down, Namath had rolled right, and three Chiefs had crushed him. Then suddenly, Len Dawson and Otis Taylor turned the game around with a 61-yard explosion to the Jets' 19-yard line. On the very next play, Dawson hit Gloucester Richardson for the game's only touchdown. With time running out, Joe Namath faded to pass. The ball sailed straight for Bake Turner in the end zone, but Jim Marcellus leaped and grabbed his second interception, and the Jets' reign as world champions was near its end. With less than a minute to play, the Chiefs punted, and the Jets had one final chance. Suddenly, the only obstacle between the Chiefs and the Super Bowl was a team called the Oakland Raiders. Last Saturday, Pro Football's playoffs began in cold, blustery Shea Stadium, 
on cold, blustery Long Island, New York. It was a day described by Joe Namath as the worst day for passing since he came to New York. The passing of Namath and of Kansas City's apparently healthy Lynn Dawson was hampered not only by cold wind and cold hands, but also by aggressive gang-fighting defensive play. teams were forced to rely on a cautious, short pass offense for most of the game. The short pass accounted for several good gains by both teams, but neither team was able to score a touchdown for the first three quarters of the game. By throwing to their running backs and their tight ends, Namath and Dawson could set up only three field goals by the league's top two scores. And at the end of three quarters, the Chiefs led 6-3. As Coach Hank Stram said later, it was like a checker game. Everybody was waiting for that one big move. Early in the fourth quarter, an interference penalty gave the Jets four downs to score from the Kansas City one. On first down, Matt Snell gained one half yard. On second down, Bill Mathis was stopped cold for no gain. On third down, all Super Joe had to do was come up with a play that would gain one half yard against the league's leading defense. Namath decided on play action. He faked Mathis into the line and rolled to his right, searching desperately for a receiver or room to run. The results were disastrous. As Namath was led toward the bench, number 11, league-leading scorer Jim Turner went in to tie the game for New York. Lynn Dawson said later he was inspired by the Chiefs' great defensive stand. On the sidelines, he had worked out the next play with Otis Taylor, number 89, the Chiefs' most dangerous long-range weapon. Taylor's main worry on the play was to properly gauge the effect of the gusting wind on Dawson's pass. Taylor succeeded, and the play became the biggest of the day, 61 yards, all the way to the Jets' 19-yard line. From the viewpoint of the Jets' defensive backfield, we can more fully appreciate one of sports' most devastating sights, a perfectly launched spiral to a receiver who knows what to do after he makes the catch. On the next play, Dawson again decided to fake the run and throw. He faded deep and found Gloucester Richardson behind Cornell Gordon for the game's only touchdown. Such was the shock from this sudden two-play attack that the stadium scoreboard operator awarded Jan Stenerud three points for the successful conversion which followed. In reality, the world champions trailed by only seven points, and Joe Namath knew that if he couldn't get the Jets at least one touchdown, he would have all winter to think about why. Several times, he almost succeeded as he threw pass after pass at the Chiefs' tough young defense.
With one minute and 50 seconds to play, Joe Namath baited to pass for the last time. The ball sails straight for Bake Turner in the end zone. But number 40 rookie Jim Marsalis leaped and made his second interception of the day, and the Jets' reign as world champions was near its end. For Jim Marsalis, less than a year out of Tennessee State College, it was a moment never to be forgotten. With only 44 seconds to play, the Chiefs were forced to punt. But another rookie, number 66 linebacker Bob Stein, took care of the final details as he recovered the game's only fumble. Happiness is a rookie bomb squatter who helps his team to climb within one game of the Super Bowl. For the Chiefs, only their old friends from Oakland now block the road to New Orleans. The last AFL championship game. The old nemesis, Oakland. Seven losses and eight games. Len Dawson tried to surprise the Raiders by throwing long to Otis Taylor. Nothing seemed to work. In the third quarter, Robert Holmes was nearly trapped for a safety. Third down from the two. Again, Len Dawson tried to surprise the Raiders by throwing long to Otis Taylor. Suddenly, a 14-7 lead, and everything was up to the defense. times in the fourth quarter, a weird turnover set up Daryl LaMonica within striking distance. And three times in the fourth quarter, the Chiefs intercepted LaMonica. The final turnover occurred when Emma Thomas grabbed his second interception and took off for the Raider goal. Thomas's 62-yard dash set up Jan Stenerud's clinching field goal, and the Chiefs had finally beaten the Raiders and had won their way to the Super Bowl. During the flamboyant 10-year history of the American Football League, several fierce rivalries developed, but none fiercer than that between the black and the red. The Oakland Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs. The AFL's two most successful teams fought each other 22 times during the decade. Each team won 11, and many of these were relentless struggles. In 1968, Oakland's high-powered offense appeared unstoppable. But in Kansas City, the Chiefs' defense broke down football's most prolific scoring machine. With his best receivers injured, coach Hank Stram resurrected the old straight T formation. The Chiefs passed a record low three times. They ran a record high 60 times. Mike Garrett for 109 yards. 
Wendell Hayes for 89 yards. Robert Holmes for 95 yards. Despite adversity, the Chiefs had powered their way to a surprising victory. Two weeks later in Oakland, quarterback Darrell LaMonica and the vengeful champion Raiders played their best game of the season and dominated the Chiefs, just as the Chiefs had dominated them two weeks before. By the end of the 1968 season, Oakland and Kansas City each had won 12 of 14 games, setting up the AFL's first Western Division playoff. And on a cold, wet day in Oakland, the league's first two Super Bowl teams finally decided a championship. By the end of the first quarter, Darrell LaMonica had fired three touchdown passes and the Raiders led 21-0. LaMonica later added two more touchdown passes, his second to Warren Wells and his third to Fred Belitnikoff. For the first time in five years, the Chiefs could not score a touchdown. The Raiders ended the Chiefs' 1968 season by giving them the worst beating in their history. In 1969, when the teams met again in Kansas City, the Chiefs were in first place and they were ready to break the Raiders' jinx. Chief quarterback Len Dawson threw the touchdown passes this time, but they were not enough to stave off unforgettable memories. The Raiders literally stole the game, 27 to 24. And the Western title was again to be decided in Oakland on the season's final day. A Dawson knee injury helped dictate another conservative game for the Chiefs. They passed only six times. They ran 48 times. But this time they scored only one touchdown the Raiders deployed their customary offense. They too scored only one touchdown, but for John Madden's Raiders, it was enough to defeat the Chiefs for the fourth straight time and for the seventh time in eight games. Three weeks later, on January 5th, 1970, Hank Stram and Len Dawson returned to the Oakland Coliseum to try and solve a colossal problem. How to defeat a team which had lost only four games in three years. A team some called the finest in the game. It was now up to the fiercest rivals in AFL history to decide one final championship in the AFL's last showdown. At number 25, Belitnikov deep against rookie cornerback Jim Marsalis, number 40. Although unsuccessful, this play set up a pass to number 81, Warren Wells, who carried to the Kansas City three. In a replay, we can see that Belitnikov again went deep, 
allowing Wells to cut behind him for the big game. On the next play, Charlie Smith followed perfect blocking to the game's first score, and the Raiders appeared to be well on their way to a championship. Has turned the ball over to the Chiefs, but Kansas City's intricate offense had produced only two first downs and an abundance of frustration. With only three minutes left in the half, the Chiefs' offense suddenly began to move. Helped by several key penalties against the Oakland defense, the Chiefs found themselves beyond midfield for the first time. Dawson sent Otis Taylor down the middle to attract attention and then threw to Frank Pitts for a 41-yard explosion to the Raiders' one-yard line. From there, Wendell Hayes plunged into the end zone and suddenly the game was tied as the first half ended. The next play, Mike Garrett ripped off the longest run of the day, 12 yards. However, Garrett's fumble was recovered by Tom Keating, who in his excitement attempted to advance the ball, much to the regret of a sideline cameraman. This unusual accident seemed to set off a chain reaction. On the next play, all pro safety man Johnny Robinson was practically impaled on the head of an official. After Willie Mitchell replaced Robinson, LaMonica tried to throw deep, and the result was another weird play with bodies falling all over the field. The most important fallen body belonged to Darrell LaMonica, who had painfully jammed the fingers of his passing hand into the face mask of defensive end Aaron Brown. He sent Warren Wells toward the end zone for the touchdown but Wells slipped and Emmett Thomas intercepted for the Chiefs. One old pro was through for the day, while another surveyed the wreckage of the previous play. In a replay, we can see that Glenn Dawson had perfect protection, which allowed him to find his secondary receiver, Otis Taylor, near the right sideline. Taylor's spectacular catch seemed suddenly to turn the game in the Chiefs' favor. Dawson's next target was Robert Holmes. The entire Chiefs' offense turned to opening a way for Robert the tank to pass through. Meanwhile, the struggle continued between Otis Taylor and Namaya Wilson, and Dawson chose this moment to take advantage of the situation. Interference was called against Wilson, and the Chiefs were only seven yards from the lead. In a replay, we can see why an interference call is one of the toughest any official has to make. In two plays, Robert Holmes accounted for the rest of the yardage to the Raider goal. And the Chiefs had won a seven-point lead after three quarters. Just run out the clock. Just score.
Emmett Thomas's 62-yard dash with his second interception put the Chiefs within easy reach of Jan Stenerud's foot. Stenerud's field goal had finally given the Chiefs a commanding 10-point lead. But one more bit of madness gave the Raiders one final chance. Four down from the Kansas City 13. Emmett Thomas's third interception was just another frustrating out-of-bounds catch but not nearly so frustrating as the rest of the game was for Daryl LaMonica and the Raiders. On last down, Aaron Brown finished the Raiders' offense for the season. It was a fitting conclusion for the Chiefs' joy and the Raiders' frustration were due most of all to a great Kansas City defensive team. Despite a courageous effort by the AFL Player of the Year, the Western Division champion Raiders could not cope with the Chiefs' defensive team, which is finally gaining recognition as the game's toughest. The Raiders could not cope with the Chiefs' defensive line, which also is finally gaining recognition as the game's toughest. Defensive ends Aaron Brown and Jerry Mays. Tackles Buck Buchanan and Curly Culp. Buchanan. Brown. Mays. Cult. The Raiders could not cope with a defensive end named Aaron Brown. said, I told them to turn it on. Give it all you've got. We did. And we beat one of the greatest teams in pro football. Maybe the greatest. So again, we're at the Sugar Bowl. Tulane Stadium in New Orleans. And it is time for the Super Bowl. Hi, I'm Jack Buck, Pat Summerall alongside, and believe it or not, there's one thing that hasn't been said about this game to this point. Obviously, both coaches and both teams have a tremendous amount of respect for each other, but the thing that Jack Buck is referring to is something that Bud Grant told me during the week, and that is that Kansas City is the type of team, a physical team, a hitting team that Minnesota has had trouble with throughout the entire year. They expect a tough game. And you know what the Vikings have accomplished to get here in the Super Bowl? We're going to meet the Minnesota team right now. The first to be introduced will be Gene Washington, their outstanding wide receiver, number 84. This fellow caught nine touchdown passes during this year. He's the Michigan State alumnus. And he's the home run hitter of the Minnesota offense. Great speed, good hands, 
And he has really developed. Gene Washington, number 84. This is Grady Alderman at left tackle on offense, number 67. Alderman, the only member from the original expansion draft still left with a Minnesota team. Small for an offensive tackle, but very, very effective. Number 63 is Jim Ballone, their left guard. Uh, Ballone, 6'3", 255, the strongest member of the offensive front line. And the perennial all-league, Mick Tinglehoff at center, number 53. Signed as a free agent from Nebraska. Milk Sunday, number 64. He's their right guard. The 20th draft choice, 6'2 and 250. Ron Yerry, number 73 at right tackle. Their first draft down. choice of last year. Here's the tight end, John Beasley, played at California. Beasley, a fine blocker with good size as well. The other wide receiver is John Henderson from Michigan, number 80. And like Gene Washington, he too has great speed. Here's Joe Cap, the Minnesota quarterback, number 11. And what else need be said about him? Dave Osborne, their best runner this year, number 41, played at North Dakota. Had a great game last week against the Cleveland Browns. Bill Brown, the nine-year veteran from Illinois, is number 30, and the remainder of the Vikings with their coach, Bud Grant. And so we have met the defensive unit of the National Football League champions, the Minnesota Vikings. And now the Kansas City Chiefs will be introduced we start with the left defensive end, Jerry Mays, number 75. One of four members of the Kansas City defensive unit who played in the 1966 Super Bowl. Curly Culp is at left tackle, number 61. 6'1", 265, the quickest of the front four for Kansas City. Here's the biggest man on the field, Buck Buchanan, number 86 at right tackle. 6'7", and 275 pounds from Grambling. He doesn't need to get the passer down. He can just stand up in front of him. Number 87 is Aaron Brown, the right defensive end for the Chiefs. 6'5", and 265, and what a game he had last week against the Oakland Raiders. Now we'll check the linebackers. And that's Bobby Bell, number 78, at the left side. And Bud Grant, the Minnesota coach, said this is probably the finest linebacker in football. In all of football, that is. And now the middle linebacker is Willie Lanier, number 63. Tough hitter is Willie Lanier. In the middle, good speed, 6'1", 245, a three-year man. Here's a Notre Damer, Jim Lynch, number 51, at right linebacker. This is a man that the Oakland tried to work on last week without success, we might add. A fine outside linebacker. At the left corner is a rookie, Jim Marcellus, number 40. Kansas City's number one draft choice of this past year, a man who plays up close to the offensive receiver. The strong safety is Jim Kearney, number 46. Kearney, too, of course, with excellent speed. This is number 18, Emmett Thomas. They've gone to the other cornerback. That's Thomas at the right corner. And now, this is Kearney, the strong safety, number 46 from Prairie View. Kearney was a quarterback in college for the great receiver Otis Taylor. And they are introducing Johnny Robinson. He may or may not play, number 42. And a roar for Robinson, of course, because he is from LSU. Played his collegiate football there. He's the quarterback of their defensive unit. The Kansas City Chiefs and Coach Hank Strand. Temperature is 53 degrees here in New Orleans, and they say no more rain after a very rainy morning. We'll be ready for the start of today's Super Bowl game in just a moment. In an age when most football coaches are still imitating Vince Lombardi's fundamental approach to the game, Hank Stram, the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, stands apart as an original thinker. In 1969, his progressive theories made Kansas City the most entertaining team in all of football. Strand's Wild West Variety Show. Stram was the director, and with a team of stars, he translated his daring theories into hard-hitting facts.
the Chiefs outfought and outfought every opponent and raced to the championship of the American Football League. In the National Football League, the championship was won by the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings had neither the talent nor the diversity of the Chiefs. All they had was a spirit that refused to accept defeat and Joe Cap, number 11, a hungry gut fighter from Canada who played quarterback with faith and fury instead of finesse. Bud Grant and triggered by Cap, the Vikings shot down 12 straight opponents, the longest single season winning streak in 35 years. Their strategy was basic. The team that hits is the team that wins. The Vikings scored the most points, permitted the fewest, and dished out such punishment along the way that they came to be known as the Purple Gang. Neither snow nor icy fields nor rugged competition could stay their drive to the Super Bowl and a collision with Hank Stram's Kansas City Chiefs. Let's go, boys. Hey, let's go, man. Pump it out of that end zone, Jan. Come on, boy. Get it up in the air. Get it up in the air! Cover, red cover, right return! Get it, Johnny! After four minutes of play, the Chiefs gained possession of the ball and immediately revealed Hank Stram's well-conceived offensive game plan. Stram had decided that the Chiefs could move against the Viking defense on quick pitch passes in front of the Minnesota cornerback. Outside, Leonard, that double wing, far, yes, do it more often. You're throwing a one, he can't, he can't cover that thing, Lenny. Throw it any time. That hit you on the outside. That is, that's a good time to throw it right there, you see. Let's go tight eye, double hook. Hut. Pass! Pass! Look at that stuff in front, is like stealing. We gotta do more of it. Quarterback Lynn Dawson proved the worth of Stram's strategy. Six of his seven completions in the first half were quick, sudden throws to the sideline. Oh, that's it. That's the one. They can't cover that in a million years. No way in the world they can uh, cover that stuff. See, that's like stealing over there. Double team those ends. No way they can cover that stuff. So keep them down so we throw over the top. Take it to the bloody. The Chiefs operated from a bewildering cluster of offensive formations leaving the Vikings too confused to properly defend the passes. We're catching them moving. We're catching them moving a little bit. They're not ready for that quick count. Look at them running around. They didn't even know where to go on the lineup. That's it. They didn't know where Mike was. Didn't know where he was. They didn't know where to go. Yeah, Kosalki was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. They look like they're flat as hell. Pass! Watch a pass! After Dawson had the Vikings thinking about his quick passes to the outside, 
he moved his attentions to his running game. Kansas City's running backs moved like lizards, slithering in and out of slits and crevices in the Viking line. Although they did not break free for long runs, they gained consistently and gave the Chiefs essential control of the first quarter and genuine domination of the second. Come on, Lenny! Pump it in there, baby! Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Let's go, there, baby! Push it all down! What'd you have? I didn't have Paul play. I wonder if we can go blue slot uh, 32 XGO back under the sideline here. All right? Keep negotiating that ball right down the field, boys. The least visible but most important aspect of Stram's game plan was executed by Kansas City's well-schooled offensive line. Wary of the quick, wild rush of Minnesota's two all-pro ends, Carl Eller, number 81, and Jim Marshall, number 70, the Chiefs made them cautious early in the game. They ran the ball inside and outside and varied their blocking pattern so often that neither Marshall nor Ella could totally commit himself to driving in on the quarterback. Field goal! Okay, Jan, baby, get it over! In the first quarter and again in the second, Jan Stenerud kicked field goals and gave the Chiefs a 6-0 lead. That's a good start. That's a good start, a good kick. away yeah that's it all right okay let's do let's a job up, hey these guys go, can't move the ball against us let's do the job on it baby come on watch a play action pass play action pass and make sure you keep them in that pocket the early momentum initiated by the chief's offense was sustained by an adventurous defense designed to squeeze joe cap in the pocket and to reach Minnesota's tough runners before they could get started. Overpowered by the Chiefs' enormous defenders, the Viking running game gained only 24 yards in the first half. Make sure you mark it right. Make sure you mark it right. Oh, you lost your place. Measure it. Take the chains out there. Oh, they didn't make it. My God, they made that by an inch. He, he definitely gave an extra foot. Bad. Very bad. When Cap turned to his passing game, Kansas City's close guarding cornerbacks and linebackers smothered his short passes and intimidated his receivers on longer ones. Come on, turn around! Jump! Our ball! It's our ball! Then damn it! Come on! Damn it! Damn it! That guy didn't see the ball! It was a free ball, they didn't see it. Didn't see the play. What? How can... We got six people out there and you can't see. Oh, that's a lousy call, ref. Open your eyes. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Then the ball was knocked loose when he made contact. Boy, that's a bad call. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? What, All six of The what ball part? jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought, I thought, and nobody... you, were, I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? Midway through the second period, the Chiefs' secondary forced the game's first turnover when Jim Morsalis knocked the ball from John Henderson and Johnny Robinson recovered on Minnesota's 46. At this point in the game, Hank Stram decided on a most unlikely gambit. Listen, let's have a uh, blue right slot fake draw 908-51, G-O reverse, you know. Yeah, okay. 
Here, here comes a reverse coming from, from tight eye. Here comes a reverse from tight eye. Could be wide open here coming up. Tight eye reverse. You might pop something over back into this side, you know? But we got a reverse coming from tight eye. Come on, get him out of there, Lenny. Come on, baby. That's right, it happened fast, boys. The 51 Geo reverse would plague the Vikings all day, and it's worth repeating. Carl Ella, number 81, was lured inside by the initial fake, then chopped down by Dave Hill, clearing the outside for a 20-yard gain by Frank Pitts. Pitts's run set up another field goal by Stenerud and the Chiefs' lead increased to nine points. We break them down with these threes and then we get on that board with some big ones. Come on, Vikings, get it back. Come on, we gotta get to seven. Hey, hey, we, go, we don't give them anything, man. We keep scoring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire. Kick it up high, Bjorn, let's go, come on. No frozen rope. Get it up in the air so we can cover this thing, all right? Let's go. Minnesota's Charlie West opened the way to the game's first touchdown when he misplayed the kickoff and Kansas City recovered. We got the ball, boys. Five plays later with the ball on the four-yard line, Coach Dram called for a... 65 toss power trap. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. Let's block! Let's Come on, go. Lenny, let's, let's get seven the ball points! Out. Come on, let's go! 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. It's in there! Is that boys? Is that there, Rats? Nice going, baby! Yes, sir, Rats! Yes, sir, boys! Was that there, Rats? Nice going, baby! Yes, sir, Rats! Yes, sir! The mentor! 65 toss power trap! Yeah! <laughs> I tell you, that baby, it's there. Yes, sir, boys. <laughs> Woo! Nice go. Yeah, yeah, nice hey, we go. <laughs> okay, let's go, boys. Let's go, babes. Was that there, boys? The old mentor? You saw it again on television. Yo, coach pumped it in there, boys. As we review the 65 horse power trap, watch the Kansas City line entice the Vikings to the outside, leaving Mike Garrett an open path through the middle. Garrett's touchdown made the score 16-0 and closed out a first half completely dominated by the Kansas City Chiefs. Down, throw that, get your square out here. They haven't come close to covering him. Go, Chiefs, go! Go, Chiefs, go! Go, Chiefs, go! The Chiefs responded to the Vikings' score by returning to the strategy which had proved so effective in the first half. And when Minnesota challenged the Chiefs' short passing game, Stram instructed Dawson to switch to his deceptive running attack. Reverse. Here comes a reverse, boys. Yeah. Here comes a reverse. Here goes again. Reverse. Come on. There it is. Right there, partner. You got it. First down. You got the first down. Here it is. Move it. Oh, hey, move it up a little bit. You look, look at his foot here. My God, look where his front of the foot is and where you put the ball. Yeah, but here's, yeah. You did good, you did good, you marked it good. No, he's all right. That's good, you marked it good, you marked it good. You did a hell of a job, nice going. Great job, you marked it good. That's an excellent call, those officials are doing a hell of a job. Was that reverse there, boys? It was there, wasn't it, boys? It was, it was there, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, watch the With the ball on the Viking 46-yard line, Dawson decided to resume his passing tactics. It was a wise decision. In a brilliant individual effort, Otis Taylor turned a routine hitch pass into a devastating touchdown.
Come on. Where to go? Otis. Yeah, yeah. That's the way to inject that ball over the goal line. Hey, I baby. knew you'd do it, Doc! Hey, Doc! I knew you'd do it! That's it. Woo! What's that there, boys? It was very important that we score on that last drive, I'll tell you that. A repeat of the touchdown reveals it began from the same sideline pattern, which had worked so successfully in the first half. Taylor's remarkable run gave Kansas City a 23-7 lead late in the third period. Much of the credit for the interceptions must go to the persistent giants of the Chiefs' defensive line, who dealt Joe Cap a season's worth of punishment in a single game. Through it all, Cap was brave and tough as he always has been. But by the end of the day, he was physically beaten, something he has never been. <laughs> Defeat is a personal thing, nice going, but victory nice belongs going, to everyone. Nice going, Willie. Hey, Johnny. Johnny, let's hey. Coach Fran get in there. Johnny, hey, Johnny. Hell, in hell of a job. Nice going, baby. Nice going, baby. That's a big kick for us, boy. Nice going. Hey, Bobby. Bobby Stein. Hey, Bob. Nice going, boy. Go ahead. Go ahead for Mike. Len Lenny Dawson. How to be, Leonard. You're a champ. Nice going, Leonard. Nice going, baby. Nice going, baby. On January 11, 1970, victory belonged to Hank Stram and his Kansas City Chiefs. The world champions of professional football. World champions, the world champions. Arbanus, the tight end, goes to the right side. Otis Taylor is also to the right side, and Dawson goes to the air. And Garrett Clark. Across the 39 out of bounds at the 37 yard line, and we have seen comparable patterns from both teams throwing to those backs coming out of the backfield. 1966 gave Green Bay a lot of trouble throughout the day. Third down and two and a half from the 44. And Dawson hits pick to the pass down the sideline. Inside the 40 to the 35 yard line before Wally Hilgenberg, number 58, tackled him. That was third and short yardage in the first surprise call of the day. First period is half over. Dawson, good protection, swings one out, and it was batted down, I think, by Jim Marshall that got his hands up. And it is a fourth down play. It's got 48. Dawson holding, center route kick, 27 out of 35 this year. But center route, booms it there, and it's good. And the city goes out in front, and Dawson did a great job of getting that ball down on a snap that came into his midsection. The score, Kansas City, three. Minnesota, nothing. Back with the Chiefs kickoff in just a seventh, Minnesota, in their own 23. Look out, Joe Cap, and down he goes with Jerry Mays, the defensive end, getting to him, along with Curly Culp, number 61, the defensive tackle, third down, long yardage. Left, Henderson right, and Cap back to the air, and swings it to the other side, dive for him, look at that pursuit. There was the linebacker, Jim Lynch, picking him up. Remember earlier when Osborne caught a similar pass and he was all alone, Lynch wasn't there. He was there that time. Shifting out of the eye. That's the fake to Holmes. Garrett slipped and fell. The pass is caught by Pitts. Beyond the 35-yard line. Garrett, I think, was the primary receiver, Pat, and he slipped and fell when he headed for the sideline. And Dawson picked up Holmes down the middle. Caught that last one. Here's the quickie out here. Otis Taylor. And he draws a lot of people. But a big gain on the play. Paul Krause, the tackler, once again. For the most part, Minnesota plans to roll their zone so they can double cover 
Otis Taylor. That could be uh, one of the reasons for the success of Frank Pitt so far. The Minnesota bench. Pick up of nine on the pass to Otis Taylor and Dawson is holding a hot hand here in the early going of the Super Bowl. 2.06 remaining in the first quarter. Second down and one. Holmes and Garrett in the eye. Second man Garrett. First down, Kansas City crossing midfield. Hasn't rained for the last couple of hours. Ball at the 49. Arbanis goes to the right side and hits Switch left. Dawson to Garrett. Garrett broke two tackles. And then he was finally stopped by Gary Larson. He dug you those fast moving feet of his and he changed direction. It's now third down and four. Dawson throwing into the end zone to Taylor and broken up by McKee. Who is peeved that he didn't pick it off. It'll be 32 yards. Dawson will spot it. And a road kicks it. Good. Six nothing, Kansas City. Six nothing, Kansas City, and back with the Chiefs kickoff in just a moment. Jones, number 26, at the top, and Charlie West, number 40. This time, Spinner Road kicking into the wind, and we'll have a run back by West, who takes it on the fly at the 15-yard line, 25, and crosses the 30, and a fumble, a fumble, and we'll see if the whistle is blown or not. Evidently, the Vikings still keep the football. Curtis McClinton made the tackle, number 32. Should do pro football player, and he wrestled Osborne down, second down and 10. Go from the 32. Cap throwing, and a fumble by Henderson. Kansas City has the football as Johnny Robinson picked it up. That's the reason they were so anxious to get this veteran in there. He was over there helping out as a free safety, and he got the fumble. Humboldt State. He's in the middle of that power eye. Dawson throwing long for Taylor. Intercepted. Paul Krauss went up and got it. Here's Bob Lee punting from the end zone. Mike Garrett and Willie Mitchell are deep inside their 45. Kansas City rush, not too concerted. Here's Garrett being blasted at the 44-yard line. A power eye and a rather tight key. And they run from that, and here comes Pitts on the end of round. McBee latches onto him, but not until he got to the 25-yard line, and it didn't take him long to get there. Did off of the screen, 25. The motion starts to the other direction. Good fake by the setback. Out in front is Mormon. Kansas City taking advantage, I think, of the tremendous pursuit which Carl Eller always puts when the play goes in the opposite direction. Hay and Mike Garrett do pretty quick. Third down and four. Here's a delay to Hayes. He did not get the first down, and we'll see how the Chiefs play it. Who's allowed them to do so. Dawson will hold it to 25, and Stenerud will try to make it three for three. 7.57 left in the half. Good again. The score is now Kansas City nine, and Minnesota nothing. And back with the Kansas City kickoff in just a moment. Clinton Jones at the top and Charlie West number 40. Benarud kicking into the wind, gets it up high. It'll be returned by Charlie West who takes it, bubbles it. Kansas City has it. Kansas City has the football inside the 20-yard line. The last time Benarud kicked off, West took it on the fly. I was surprised he caught it. He didn't this time. He had to come a long way as that ball hung up there a long time. Center has kicked it against the wind. Looked as if it might have been recovered by number 65, Remy Prudhomme. It was Prudhomme who picked up the football at the guards who fire and hill at the tackle. Here's the delay to Hayes. Hayes to the 15 yard line. To the right side. Austin rolling right, throwing end zone to the five yard line. It will be a first down as it's caught by Otis Taylor. Arbanis is on the left side, and here's Garrett slanting in. He ran by Dixon, the extra defensive lineman who was put in there, and went right in from the five-yard line for the touchdown, and now it's 15 to nothing in favor of Kansas City. The score mounts to 16 to nothing, Kansas City, and back with the Chiefs kickoff in just a moment. 
Big rush. They were all turned loose. Watson Cannon dropped them after Curly Culp had broken up the perimeter. Curly Culp was the first one through. And it is on the right side. It's third and nine. <laughs> Dawson stays on the ground to McVeigh running to the short side. He did not get a first down. Or perhaps he did. Carl Eller tackled him. He had to get to the 34-yard line. We'll see where they give him his forward progress. There's Dawson on the end around again to Pitts. Winston missed him. Pitts gets to the 45-yard line. Carl Eller chased the play, caught up with it, and made the stop. Five defensive back in for Kansas City. And now Camp runs into his running back and runs for a couple of yards. And let's see if Minnesota calls timeout. The end of the first half with a score. Kansas City 16, Minnesota nothing. Pretty touchdown today. Jan Stenenrud has three field goals. Dave Osborne has scored for the Vikings. Second six from the 22. Austin on a delay to Hayes. And Garrett did a good job of helping Hayes break loose before Hilgenberg and Warwick tackled it. Pete Brewster and Tom Pratt. A first down at the 28. And there's Garrett sticking his way across the 30-yard line. Now only 250 remaining in the third quarter. Bonnie Warwick, the middle linebacker, tripped him up. Three yards. Run out of the eye and a delay to Hayes. And a fine tackle saved the day for the moment by Lonnie Warwick, the middle linebacker. Crowd reacts. Here's the end around again to Pitts. Look at the blocking he's got out in front. Boy, they make that play work in a hurry. Ursel McPhee, the cornerback, was being stormed, but he did force the play out of bounds. Hayes was a wing back to the right. Dawson fakes short and threw long. Sherrockman was there covering. A flag has been thrown back near the line of scrimmage as that downfield battle went on between Pitts and Sherrockman. The ball goes to the 47-yard line and a personal foul against the Vikings. Had a little shot as he tried to get by. Quick snap and the quick pass to Taylor. He got away from McVee. He's inside the 15. He scores! From the 47-yard line. Kostofi missed him. McVee missed him. What a great athlete he is. I think the picture speaks for itself. Sherrockman misses. A uh, McBee missed first, I beg your pardon. And then that was Krause who missed next. So the touchdown, from 47 yards away, our longest scoring play of the day aside from a field goal, and they end around. Dawson gets it down, Stenerud makes it good. 23 to 7 in favor of Kansas City. Vikings. Cap has to complete this one or lose, have to punt. Tries to get it to Beasley. It's intercepted by the linebacker, Willie Lanier. And Kansas City has the football again. Be Lanier stepped in front of Beasley, who is 6'3 and 230 pounds, and intercepted. He has to rest for Bob Grimm. And now on first down, Cap rolls left. Stops and throws, and he throws long, and it is intercepted by the same Johnny Robinson we've been talking about, who gets his second of the day, and Kansas City gets the ball back again. Robinson had picked up eight during the regular season and gets his second today. That's twice that Cap has tried to throw the same pattern to Beasley, and twice it's been picked off, once by Lanier, now by Robinson. Again, he throws that ball, lobs the ball into the middle of three Kansas City defenders. Not much way you could hope to complete that one. Henderson to the left, Washington to the right. And Cap being chased by Buchanan. Now Brown, fumble. Minnesota picks it back up again. And Cap is hurt. Cap trying to get up. Lynch in a very solicitous fashion. This pursuit by Kansas City. Buchanan 86 is first. 
Then Brown, 86, forces him wide. That's Buchanan. 87 is Brown, and he puts the crusher on. The crusher it is. And Malone, 63, recover the fumble. Lindsay is split right. Big to Osborne. Buchanan is picked off, and so is the pass by Emma Thomas. Thomas is at the 35, and down he goes. And again, with Bill Brown making the tackle, the Chiefs get the fullback football back once more. Kansas City's third interception. It's the same pass that Cap had intercepted twice as Quazzo rolls to his left and tries to hit his tight end. This is Lindsay coming across here. And he just couldn't force it in there. Thomas with the interception. Bill Brown's going to make the tackle. With a good tackle it is. Fakes to Hayes and goes to the air, surprisingly. Now he's going to run, even more surprising. And he really ripped. And Dawson got to the earth as quickly as he could as Alan Page and others were after him. Dawson on a delay to McVeigh, a fake. He still has the ball. Ellard drops him down, and a flag is thrown. And it was Page who got him after he ducked away. And now, a little extracurricular action, quickly broken up by the officials. Both benches come into the area, and cooler heads prevail, gratefully, with 1.53 remaining in the game. Bonnie Warwick jumped in there. Alan Page took a rap at Lenny Dawson and brought the flag about after Ka Carl Eller had made the original tackle. And referee John McDonough, shoes going to be shy of a first down. But just barely shy. Looks like maybe a half yard or something like that. And if they do get this first down, oh, it looks like it is a first down, Jack. It is. They got enough yardage, as it turned out, for a first down to the 45-yard line of Minnesota. Gives to McVay. McVay broke one tackle. McVay got away from Carl Kosalki, who was up lurking on the line of scrimmage, and then Jim Marshall tackled him. Completion record for the afternoon. Mike Livingston is the quarterback now. Livingston on a straight-ahead play to Wendell Hayes. One minute left in this Super Bowl. Bonnie Warwick, the tackler. That was the second down play. Minnesota not really anxious to stop the clock. A trail by a considerable margin. <laughs> Running with the ball is Robert Hall. The tackle is made by Lonnie Warwick. The Vikings do not stop the clock. And you can count it down yourself. The score is 23 to 7. We're going to go to both dressing rooms. Stram is already on the shoulders of his players. And after being vanquished by Green Bay in 1967, the Chiefs are the champions of pro football. Escorted off the field. You can see 89. You can see number three. 89 is Taylor. Number three is Stenner Road. And the hilarity on the field. Hank, the team and Hank and uh, most uh, most especially Len Dawson because I know how much the game meant to him. And uh, we're very proud to be the champions of pro football. And uh, so it's a fantastic sport. And uh, we'll now have to set out to defend those honors next year. Lamar Hutt, the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs, and we're going to ask both of you gentlemen to stay with us for just a moment. We'll get Commissioner Roselle for the presentation, and we'll be back with the 1969 world champions. Back in the Kansas City locker room where Commissioner Pete Roselle, the commissioner of pro football, is going to make the presentation to the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs, Lamar Hunt, head coach Hank Stram, commissioner. Thank you. Club proved themselves true champions. They overcame injuries early in the year and then on successive games. You defeated last year's Super Bowl winners, the Jets, the Western Division winners, the Raiders, today the Super Bowl. True champions, and congratulations to you and Lamar. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. We appreciate this honor greatly, and uh, I assure you that 
Uh, this belongs to our whole squad and our whole organization. It's a great compliment to a great bunch of people, great compliment to Lamar. Uh, Lenny Dawson performed extremely well today under adversity, but we're very happy to be champions of the world, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to maintain the prestige of this great honor. Thank you very much. Hank, again, our congratulations. The beautiful Tiffany Trophy, the beautiful silver Tiffany Trophy representation of the champion of all the world. And uh, again, could I get your reaction, uh, Lamar Hunt, as you look back to those other years, some 10 years ago, there must be quite a reaction. That's pretty fantastic. It's a beautiful trophy, and it really is a satisfying conclusion to the 10 years of the American Football League. And the, there have been a lot of people put a lot of time and sweat and energy Always into it. And uh, I want to say especially a thanks to the people of Kansas City. This trophy really belongs to them, too, as well as the organization, because uh, the team is Kansas City's. Very happy owner, Lamar Hunt. Again, our congratulations to you, Hank Stram. I know thank you me. want to get around and talk to your individual players. Uh, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you very we can much. Maybe have you come back and spend a few more minutes with us. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hunt. You. Ernie, this is Ernie Ladd. I hope you can see big Ernie Ladd. I just, well, me, you me, said me. something just a moment ago. Ernie Ladd was not a part of this victory here today. He's been a big part of the Kansas City Chiefs. Ernie Ladd, you said something. You were a part in your heart. Oh, yes, of course. I've been wrestling in the offseason in Madison Square Garden, around New York and Boston and other places. But in my heart, I want to tell you, I was a part of this organization. Like, they might try to forget the American Football League, but we'll never forget it. Some of the founders, we'll never forget it. A lot of people I won't want to forget it either. I let some of the participants get in here and talk with you. Ernie, great, like great, great job. Yeah, so let's go right now to Pat Summerall, and then we'll be back in a moment with Lenny Dawson. All right, Frank, as you can tell, it's Bedlam. I'm with uh, one of the real veterans of this Kansas City defensive unit, and the man they tell me is the, the inspiration leader for the whole team. That would be Jerry Mays. And congratulations, Jerry, on an outstanding afternoon today. Thank you so much. I don't believe I've ever been so happy in my life. I, I can well know. imagine. Before the game, during the week, you told me that uh, you had something stuck in your craw for a long time, the fact that Green Bay had beat you in the first Super Bowl. You think that had a lot to do with this afternoon? Well, I think it helped us a great deal, you know, the fact that we were so humiliated in the first Super Bowl. And, and uh, of course, we had confidence this time, but I think it was an added incentive for us this year. We, we've been living with that for a long time. Jerry, you took it to Minnesota right from the very beginning this afternoon. You seem to be completely in command of, uh, of the situation throughout the day. Did you approach practice like that through the week? Well, I think we had a great practice. Uh, we had, like I say, a little inner confidence, and, and, and we felt like if we could out-hit them, that we, we could beat them. And uh, we had all the respect in the world for Minnesota, but we felt deep in our heart that we were a little bit better team. Just a little, but a little bit better. <laughs> I'd like to get your impressions and your thoughts about the quarterback, Lenny Dawson. Well, of course, all of us wanted Lenny to have his biggest day today because of the, the gambling uh, question that came up during the year, and all of us love Lenny. He's been through some real rough times, uh, especially this year with his knee and his dad. And uh, we wanted all of us that have been with Lenny throughout the years have wanted him to have the biggest game today. And I think he did have a great game. You hear a lot about Minnesota being a team of love, but this is a team too like this. Oh, yeah, we're very close. We really are. And, uh, it's the darndest team I've ever seen. There's not a guy on this team, I believe, that gets on anybody else's nerves, much less dislike him. Jerry Mays, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much sir. good luck. Much good luck. Now let's go back to Frank Gifford. Jerry May, and we'll be back with Lenny Dawson, the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, and the rest of the world champions in just a moment. Lenny Dawson, the young man who engineered a great victory for his Kansas City Chiefs today, and Lenny uh, has got to be the highlight of a, a truly great career, collegiate at Purdue, uh, an All-American there, and an outstanding professional. Your own personal feelings. Well, Frank, I'll tell you, uh, everybody wants to get a shot at, at the big one. If you're a boxer you want to, and the heavyweights, you want to get a shot at the heavyweight championship. That's all we ask for all along, that you have the opportunity to play in the championship game in our league and also to play in the Super Bowl game, and then hope that we could put things together in the Super Bowl game. I thought our guys out there did a tremendous job, both offensively and defensively, because Minnesota is an outstanding football team. They, they protected you just great. Uh, it appeared that way to me. Well, they dedicated themselves to do that. Uh, I knew all along that they were going to do a great job against the, the Minnesota front four, and when you do the job like our guys did against a team like that, they have to do a fantastic job, and plus the fact that David Hill, during the course of the game, it, I think he hurt his knee or something, and he wasn't at full strength uh, the entire game. Of course, he's over Carl Eller, and he's, he's a fantastic football player. Well, any uh, no, well-played game. Uh, if we could, I'd like to have you stay with me just a moment. Right now, we'd like to cut quickly to Jack Whitaker. <laughs> The Chiefs had played in the first Super Bowl game three years before, and memories of that day still lingered. 
Memories of that beautiful, hopeful day in Los Angeles when Hank Stram's Chiefs met Vince Lombardi's Packers, the universally acclaimed Team of the Decade. But this time would be different, as Joe Cap and the Minnesota Vikings soon discovered. A decade of Green Bay Packer domination had long since ended. A new era had indisputably arrived. Packers may have been pro football's team of the 60s, but Coach Hank Stram's Kansas City Chiefs had become pro football's undisputed team of the 70s. <laughs> 